Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today for this educational InnoVise webinar. My name is Charlotte Clifford and I'm part of the marketing team here in the InnoVise UK office. I'd like to introduce our presenter. Today's presenter is Pascal Lang. Pascal is a product manager for Stewart Storm and Flood Modelling Solutions and has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things relating to smart waste water management and real-time monitoring. Thank you again for joining us. Pascal, take it away. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so in the webinar today, there are certain topics that I'd like to, to cover in, in a bit more detail. Um, I've got an agenda up on screen now. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is a bit uh, related to the, the need for data collection. Why is it that we actually carry out data collection? What are some of the benefits that we derive from that data collection? Um, some examples of those benefits. Then the types of data um, that we retrieve that's useful um, and also connectivity to those uh, information sources, that data, once it's uh, within, within premise, so to speak. Um, then looking at some examples live in the software, um, the first part there will be related to leveraging data using InfoWorks ICM and ICM Live, uh, and the second section around driving insights through data analytics. Um, then I'll follow up with a, a summary uh, and next steps, uh, and finally some of the upcoming events that are being hosted. So to start with, um, the need for data collection. Well, when I was thinking about a topic for a webinar, um, the, the one that came to mind, or sprung to mind, was related largely to some of the event duration monitoring uh, in the UK that's being deployed at the moment. Um, and that came about because of uh, legal regulatory requirements. Um, so back in 2013, um, there was a, a letter from uh, ministers to the chief executives of the water and, and sewage companies. Um, that letter highlighted some of the additional strains that are likely to be placed on sewer networks uh, along the lines of things such as climate change, uh, maybe additional um, urbanization of areas, so more impermeable area, um, uh, and perhaps also increased infiltration rates and, and, and other aspects. Um, that then led to the Environment Agency Storm Overflow Assessment Framework document. Um, there's a screenshot of that in the top right here. Uh, and that screenshot shows some of the processes that you might go through when looking at um, CSOs, the spill frequencies, maybe the amenity value of uh, some of the receiving water courses, some of the cost benefit analysis. Um, so that document was then generated um, and this is driving the expectation for most of the CSOs in the UK at this time, just for a bit of scene setting, to um, basically be monitored with event duration monitors by 2020. So there are those kind of legal regulatory requirements or frameworks that are in place um, that set an expectation for what should be done. There are also reputational aspects. So thinking about um, water courses, they have an immunity value, um, they're used for leisure activities, and obviously any kind of pollution or CSO discharges into those uh, water courses has a reputational impact for the water company um, uh, and the relevant authorities. As well as that, um, there are also performance metrics, so KPIs, thinking about things like um, flooding incidents, internal, external, pollution incidents, blockages, um, all kinds of performance metrics that are applied not just to water companies but also internally within water companies, um, and that's another driver for data collection. Okay, so just a, a few points that I wanted to, to talk about very quickly there. Um, there are many more reasons for data collection, as I'm sure many of you are aware but I just wanted to give a few examples and then move on to some of the example benefits that we can derive from data collection. Uh, and when I say data, I'm not talking necessarily just about live data, telemetry data, or sensor data, but also things like inspections, surveys, uh, and that kind of information. So replacing and repairing before asset failure. I think this is one of the key ones. If you um, carry out regular inspections and carry out things like CCTV surveys, they may pick up on assets that are um, structurally not as sound as they were the last time they were inspected, may pick up on some uh, potential failure in the, in the near-term future, and replacing or repairing those assets can be one of the benefits that's derived from that level of data collection. Okay? You're made aware of some of the risks and you're able to take action before there is a, a significant failure of some sort. Um, preventing maintenance related flooding and pollution incidents. So this is more about the detection of perhaps blockages forming, that kind of thing, um, where 
then you've got a, a maintenance issue in those sewers. If you pick up on that through data collection, you might be able to prevent a flooding or pollution incident, um, which would have been caused by uh, a blockage forming and uh, obstructing a significant proportion of the flow that should be carried through that sewer link. Uh, maintaining desired levels of resilience is another example here. So if you've got a pump station that's in a duty standby configuration, for example, um, and the duty pump goes down, you might still be able to provide the, uh, the function of that pumping station. You'll still be able to pass on the flows. But the level of resilience, the desired level of resilience, has dropped. Um, there's no, no backup pump available there anymore, meaning that data collection and detection of those kind of failures can help drive um, better, um, I guess, better resilience metrics within a company and better responses. Um, facilitating understanding of owned assets and likely scenario response. This is really one way of expressing, I guess, what hydraulic models do. Um, they drive an understanding of the assets that are owned by a company um, and also give the ability to look at how those assets, how that network as a whole, would respond to certain conditions, whether that be rainfall conditions, groundwater infiltration conditions, all kinds of changes. And those different scenarios can be run uh, and a fuller understanding is gained, meaning that you're able to carry out better um, planning activities and also better response to um, events that might be occurring in the network. I've got a couple more here. So the first one, be aware of emerging short-term risk around things like um, rainfall forecasts. That's a short-term risk if it's telling you there's a significant rainfall event on the way. Um, and that kind of data collection allows you to maybe deploy your resources to the location where they can really make a difference and help mitigate some of the, uh, the risk that that short-term forecast for rainfall intensity would bring. And then finally, protecting health and safety. Going a, an additional step further from that, if you've got those rainfall forecasts and you're applying them to assets such as hydraulic models and you're able to then better understand the actual hydraulic response to that short-term risk, that can help protect health and safety from a perspective of knowing perhaps where you might end up with spills from CSOs, where you might end up with uh, egress from, from manholes or flooding to properties. And then you can uh, respond to that in time and perhaps even prevent that effect from happening in the first place. So those are some example benefits. Um, there are many, many more, but uh, I wanted to give a, a few from my personal experience as well. When I think of data um, that we use in the wastewater side uh, of the water industry, I tend to categorize it into points or spatial data, where point data is for a given location, uh, and spatial data is spatially varying, it's geospatial, and still comes from a single data source. Um, and then along, having, along those lines as well, point and spatial data, you might have static and dynamic data, where static could be unlikely to change significantly in the short term um, and is measured infrequently, and dynamic data might frequently be polled uh, and be expected to give changing measurements and detect events. And I've got some examples of different types here, what kind of comes to mind for me. Um, so static point data, something along the lines of a, a manhole survey, It'll be carried out very infrequently, um, gives you information at a point at that manhole location, whereas some static spatial data might be LIDAR data, for example, uh, used for ground models. Okay, That's not flown too frequently. Um, it's used to generate ground models, but it tends to be static in nature. Okay, um, uh, And then dynamic data might be point data at depths, so it's sewer monitoring locations um, where you see changes in depths maybe changes in flows, changes in velocity, that kind of thing, changing profiles throughout the day as a result of you know, dry weather profiles and um, rainfall-induced uh, flows to the system. And some dynamic spatial data might include rainfall forecasts, um, which could be changing you know, as frequently as every five minutes or every 15 minutes and give you different outlooks at a spatial level across a catchment. Now, the uh, webinar is titled Overflowing with Data. And this uh, seemed quite apt once I started thinking about a list of all the different data types that I've used historically. Um, and these don't even include water quality aspects or sewage treatment work uh, measurement points. But you can see there we've got several options for rainfall observations, forecasts, rivers, groundwater levels, many, many different types of data that are used in, in the wastewater side of the industry. A few examples, um, here we've got an ultrasonic downward pointing sensor to measure depths uh, in a sewer. 
then we have um, here a reference to the gauge map, which I'll show a little bit later on. And this is specific to the UK, but it's effectively a website that you can go to and see river and groundwater levels, as well as um, rain, rain gauge values for most of the UK. Then another one that I used not too long ago, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, which was quite interesting, um, was around groundwater forecasts. So that screenshot there shows observations as you'd get from the uh, gauge map website in the red line up to a certain point. So that's ob observed data. The black line on that graph showing groundwater level forecasts based on the expected rainfall conditions. And then the, the purple scenarios are all the different kind of um, um, permutations that you might get off the basis of uh, the last 50 years worth of rainfall. So applying those rainfall categories and then seeing what the responses would give you those kind of ensembles. And then to show a spatial one as well, um, here we've got a radar image across the UK showing rainfall intensities. Um, the darker reds are indicating the higher intensities and the light blue indicating lower rainfall intensities. And you can see that kind of circular boundary around the uh, UK there indicating where the center of the different radar stations are. So uh, a few different types of data and I'll delve into how we use them in the software and some of their applications in just a minute. But now that I've hopefully set the scene a little bit uh, and started the introductions, um, there's a first poll question. Okay, so for those of you who've uh, asked that, hopefully on screen you should see the results. Most people using point static data, point dynamic data, um, some spatial static and some spatial dynamic. And I guess that 12 and 13% for the spatial data um, is probably slightly higher um, than I would have expected it to be. I think that's something or a direction that the industry is going into a certain degree. So there's more use being made of radar data and more use being made of uh, perhaps LIDAR data because that's now freely available as well, um, within the UK at least, also in other areas uh, of the EMEA region, the Europe region. Excellent. Thank you very much for answering that. And I'll move on to the next section. So this is all about data connectivity. Um, once those data points have been measured, how do we actually retrieve those back into um, a corporate environment, back into our tools? And the first ones I wanted to start with here are really the asset focused ones. Things like CCTV surveys, manhole surveys, pump station surveys, um, fats, oil and grease inspections, and there are many more. Um, now historically, at least in my experience, a number of these um, have been put into written reports and then those reports sent back to the engineering teams that originally made the request for that information to be sent through. So this means that you've got handwritten data entries, uh, they're returned to the engineering teams and then those engineering teams gain insights, valuable, valuable insights from that data that's been returned uh, and make decisions um, at a point in time based on the question that originally triggered the, re sorry, the request for that data collection. One other way um, that we can bring data back, um, which is already there for CCTV surveys in terms of the digital formatting, um, is to use digital reports, okay? To use reports and forms that are completed by the contractors that go out and do this survey work and then can feed directly into an asset management system, um, which means there's no longer that kind of manual process um, that's engaged with. And that asset system, or asset management system, can then be leveraged by the engineering teams that made the same requests originally, but also by other parts of the organization. Once it's in that asset management system and you've got a digitized record, um, that should help facilitate engagement from other parts of the business that might also be able to gener generate insights from that same information. So that's based on my experience. And I've got to, or I should confess that um, in some cases in the past where I've worked on on models, I might have had some manhole surveys completed, some pump station surveys completed. I then got those written reports, made use of those and updated the hydraulic model, but didn't necessarily always pass that information on to the asset repository within the organization that I was, I was active in um, because of additional processes, additional time that takes. It's not, not to make an excuse, but basically, occasionally some of this data is collected and is used as a one-off, um, but the actual history of the assets that we've gained information on is not necessarily passed on for further consumption within the organization. Um, the next kind of data points that we might retrieve data from would be sensors. Um, so rather than surveys and inspections, here we're talking about sensors that are taking frequent, um, frequent measurements, usually at a point, 
they then provide their data to the loggers that are on site and those loggers then return that data at given frequencies via a cell tower um, to the telemetry systems that are held on site on premise for companies typically and here on the top I've got a screenshot of a, of a telemetry system of that nature so this is showing a pump station with a couple of pumps which are both in the stopped state in this moment in time as well as a, a wet well level on the left hand side which is currently at zero the off level for that station once that's in a telemetry system that information that data um, then it's usually accessed via client logins, um, whether that be through a desktop application or via a web browser. Or that data can also be made available to external software um, using APIs. Okay, so that talks a bit about telemetry data and how that's usually fed back into an organization. Uh, and this is all done in an automated fashion, ideally. So the end user would only access that telemetry system uh, and the data would be retrieved automatically before that point. Now, as well as going on site, there are some um, data providers that will remotely host the data that's been retrieved from those sensors. So here the setup is very similar in terms of having sensors that report data back to loggers, then bring that through to a cell tower. But rather than that being brought on site for the organization that requests the data, on occasion it might be hosted via an online portal, which can then be accessed through a client login, typically through a web browser. And from there, the data can also be made available via an FTP site or perhaps an API. So there are many different ways of getting data back into an organization or getting visibility of data. Um, and those are some of the ones that I've had the most interaction with uh, in the past, so whether that be directly on telemetry systems, through online portals, or perhaps um, written reports or digital asset repositories. So I guess the second question here is, around um, what portal do you usually view data through? So whether that be through a web browser, through written reports, dedicated desktop applications, where I'm thinking of perhaps a GIS application that's been installed, or downloaded files, um, and then generic applications, perhaps an FTP download of CSV files, for example, that are then viewed in Excel. Or is there another methodology through which you normally access this kind of data? Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so 14% of you saying through a web browser, 28% through written reports, 26% through dedicated desktop applications, and 31% through downloaded files and then generic applications. So that's, uh, I'd say, roughly half-half between, actually, no, not half-half. So the written reports and I guess the downloaded files are quite manual um, through a web browser and dedicated desktop applications, perhaps less so. Um, so still a lot of engineering judgment, a lot of uh, manual interaction to get access to those insights, get access to that data. So that's really useful. Thank you for sharing that. So now that we've talked a little bit about different types of data, how they connect back into an organization or engineering teams, um, I wanted to focus a little bit on the solutions that we have available at Innovise and how those work, um, because I'll then show some of that capability in the software um, live in just a minute and help to show how perhaps there might be insights that can be derived from those different um, solutions that we host. So the first one here is thinking a little bit about the asset-centric um, data retrieval, where we're talking about inspections, surveys, um, and for that there's a info asset mobile, um, which typically sits with contractors and is all about data collection and quality control. So this is where you might set up a digital form of some sort saying for a pump station survey or for a manhole inspection um, or manhole survey, sorry, these are the required fields that you must return. Um, something perhaps along the lines of the um, chamber floor, chamber area, the ground level, that kind of information for a manhole survey. Um, and that can all be entered digitally as, as the name suggests on a mobile device and then automatically submitted to um, the Info Asset Manager database. Now this is a, a database that can be shared between InfoAssets, so the asset repository, and InfoWorks ICM. Um, and I'll show that in just a second, but effectively it means that you could have your contractors out on site returning data in a format that's been pre-specified um, and then returning that and populating that into a database that's shared between this asset repository and the hydraulic modeling um, tools. 
That sits alongside um, InfoAsset Planner, which is all about whole life costing, deterioration curves, rehabilitation planning, uh, and the optimal cost intervention points. So trying to understand when an asset might fail based on other assets of a similar type. Um, meaning that if you've got perhaps um, a failure that's been detected somewhere through telemetry um, and you then have this InfoAsset Planner tool available, you might already have some high probability failure locations that you can then investigate further uh, and perhaps try and detect. And all of that from InfoAsset Manager and Planner ultimately feeds into enterprise solutions um, such as GIS, SAP or customer contact data even uh, and helps bring all of that information through from a contractor perspective into the water company systems that can then be shared throughout that organization. Uh, and finally, there's a, a branch off the manager side here, which is a, an online portal, a web browser access to InfoAsset Manager, which means that, again, anyone in an organization or even outside the organization with relevant permissions would be able to access that asset repository and some of the history of perhaps sewers that have had blockages in the past that might have collapsed in the past or might have been inspected, all that kind of information through a, an online clean interface, which is not quite as complex as um, some of the desktop applications in terms of being specific to uh, engineering entities within a business. Um, then we've also got Infoworks ICM and ICM Live. Um, this is uh, obviously our modeling package, um, which has far more of a focus on telemetry data and observed data from the field. So whether that be things like um, rainfall, you know, observed rainfall at a spatial level, observed uh, forecast rainfall at a spatial level, pump operations, pump availability, water levels, perhaps downstream boundary conditions based on tidal influences or river levels, flow meters and gate movements and rain gauges and, and many other sources that can all be linked in via um, the time series databases. So spatial data going into one time series database, scalar data going into another time series database, and that then feeding into a hydraulic model and setting some of the conditions that are to be applied to that model. Okay, so trying to understand whether you're likely to have a, perhaps a flooding incident at a property as a result of a CSO that would normally relieve the system being drowned out by river levels or perhaps by um, by tidal ingress as well, that kind of information. And then finally, the last solution that I'm going to be showing uh, live in the software in just a moment is around SCADA Watch. Um, and this is for those areas that you might not have um, a hydraulic model for. Um, this really has a lot of power. So this sits on top of SCADA systems um, and their historians, brings that data in and carries out all kinds of different analysis on that data. Um, it's able to facilitate um, model, model upgrades, um, model calibration and verification through making that data available in a, in a cleaner fashion than you would get directly for, raw from the source um, and also allows for continually updated um, information in this interface from GIS, for example. If you've got things like sensors that have moved, they'll also move in, in SCADA Watch. Um, it brings in data from other sources, uh, more data, different data, and better decisions. I mean, that's the reference to the Internet of Things. But if you imagine the insights that could be derived by thinking about perhaps customer contacts clustered in one area versus um, abnormal readings from some of the sensors that are in the field um, and that deviate from your modeled outputs, all that information together might help paint a picture of what's going on at that location. But in isolation, each would only tell you that there is an issue of some sort. Then you've got the, um, the reference there to calibrating and verifying models more easily because the data has a lot more um, cleaning functionality within SCADA Watch. Um, operations, so things like pump efficiencies, detecting when your pumps are moving away from their ideal pump curves, their design curves. Maintenance alarms when that deviation is, is too significant. And also something that's fairly... Um, unique in my experience, at least to telemetry-based systems, the varying futures aspect. The fact that you can bring in data from forecast responses to rainfall forecast models and put multiple futures onto a single trace. So you could, for example, say this flooding hotspot under the most likely rainfall forecast for the next 24 hours is, is not likely to flood. 
under the 25% high rainfall scenario um, is just about to get to cover level and under the 5% high rainfall scenario uh, is likely to be exceeded. And that kind of insight helps then drive decision making um, and helps evidence decision making as well in terms of the resources and the actions that are performed beyond that point. And then finally, in terms of management, real-time key performance indicators, automatic reporting and data visualization, all possible in one place. Um, and I'll show that in the software in just a second as well. So let me switch across. And I'll begin here with um, Infoworks ICM. So I've opened the ICM Live Configuration Manager um, along with the Info Asset Manager suite um, in the latest snapshot of the software, which is the um, release 10.0 candidates to a certain degree. Um, so this is non-release software because I want to show some of the functionality that's going to be available in 10.0 as well. Um, and hopefully it'll go perfectly. I um, have lots of confidence. So I'll start by opening up um, a representation of a hydraulic model. And what we see here is uh, the ocean to the west. And then we've got a, a village that leads down to a, a town, a slightly larger town here. And um, what I want to show is really around the hydraulic model initially. Um, just to show those that maybe are not directly familiar with this, um, the point objects that you see here are manholes typically. And then the links that you have between those tend to be the, the sewers that run between those manholes. And I can bring up a, a long section profile and just flip that in the direction of flow. Um, and what you see here is, is that stretch that's been highlighted in the geoplan, um, along with the pipes. Um, and then the ground level is the top of this brown area, and the manholes are located at each of these points along that stretch. OK, so the power of the hydraulic model is to take your GIS data, have a representation of that, but also then give you the hydraulic response to conditions that you're applying to that network. So if we had results, you'd see the varying flows, the depths, um, and velocities in these locations and where you might get flooding and all those kind of impacts. Now the power of having this um, sat alongside the asset register or the asset repository that I talked about earlier in terms of Info Asset Manager is that if you have an issue here um, then one thing that you can do is bring on your asset network alongside your model network and when I drag this on what this is going to give me is not just the hydraulic hydraulically significant properties of some of these uh, these assets, some of these sewers, some of these manholes, but it's also going to give me the history, the event history to those. So you can see that a lot of the links have now turned pink. Those that are pink, um, that means that they've got CCTV surveys associated with those links. So if you were suffering, or if you saw from flow surveys as you're building your hydraulic model, for example, that there seemed to be a lot of infiltration in this area, then what you could do um, within the same interface in the same database is reference both your asset network and your hydraulic model network through, for example, clicking on one of the pipes, going to the properties of that pipe, and then this is showing us the asset repository associated with the pipe, so a lot more information in terms of descriptive information that's not necessary for the hydraulics. Um, maybe, you know, the year it was laid, uh, the materials rather than just the roughness value, that kind of information. But from here, you can also navigate to associated objects with that pipe. And here you'll have a list of the CCTV surveys, some of the inspections. And when you do that, all from within the same interface, it will tell you when a survey was carried out. And you can go to this defects tab and see what defects are associated with the asset that you've just selected and how far along the asset those defects take place. So from within the ICM Live Configuration Manager, or ICM for that matter, I can actually also play through um, some of the results or some of the data that was provided with the CCTV survey, look at the state uh, of this pipe, and perhaps pick up on some of the misalignments, some of the cracks that are there, and that might help then help me understand why I'm seeing those higher infiltration rates in that vicinity and give me confidence as I associate uh, particular defects with the hydraulic model that are then going to give me the kind of response that I'm seeing in the observed data for that same location. And all of these um, inspections have codes associated with the pipe along certain distances. And if you um, click on one of these drop downs for a code, it's going to give you the uh, more descriptive uh, term for that as well. So FH stands for finished survey. And I can look through these 
and gain a better understanding of the asset condition and the asset history and also the events. Um, so thinking back to a flow survey um, that was deployed uh, for some work I did a, a few years ago, um, that picked up on some abnormal flows for part of the flow survey period. And then looking back at the asset repository, which also stores um, event data and incident data, um, I was able to see that there's a, a tanker that was deployed for a prolonged period to a site upstream of the monitor location that I was looking at. And I could also see that there was a blockage that formed on a particular pipe there uh, and information associated with that blockage, which helped me to replicate that condition in the network and then better understand the uh, hydraulic match that I was getting. Okay, so that's a, a quick example of what some of the uh, power of having both your hydraulic model and your asset information in the same place uh, can help bring, some of the insights that can derive. Um, next, I want to move on to scalar time series databases. So thinking entirely about what's applied here to the hydraulic model, um, if we do that through something called a, a time series database that I showed in one of the earlier slides, and one specific example I want to give here is to create a new time series database and this is going to be bringing in data from the environment agency. Um, when you open one of these time series databases there are multiple tabs along the bottom. The first one to populate is the data sources tab and this data sources tab is effectively a pointer at a database somewhere where your um, live data that you want to use in the model is being stored. So we've got multiple types here. You know, you can store your telemetry data, for example, in Oracle, SQL Server, Pi Historians, multiple connectors. Um, in this particular case, I want to set up an example that's looking at environment agency data hosted online and accessed through an API. The server name for that data, which is available um, freely online, is environment.data.gov.uk. And the time zone that the data is in, um, because it's UK based, will be London. And when I select that, that same reference can now be set into individual stream names. Now I'm just going to switch across to a web browser here and show the gauge map sites. Again, this was on one of the earlier slides. Uh, I just want to show this. Um, I guess live, right? Um, zoom in to the area of interest for me in this case, which is uh, just down the road from, from Wallingford where I am now, um, and that's around Benson. So we've got the Benson lock. And when I click on that via this website, I immediately get the latest data that's available. And the latest data available in this case is for today, so midday, just half an hour old, which is really quite powerful um, and you get the river level as well as the downstream level for this particular site. Now all of the sites that you see that are, um, are on this website are available via the API as well and rather than me just typing in the relevant reference um, what I want to do here is just show how you get to those IDs. So EA gauge station IDs is something you can search on and there's this real-time API reference DEFRA data services platform you click on that, then along the left-hand side, there are a number of different options. Um, and the one that we want is the stations option, which allows us to determine which of the stations on this gauge map um, website we want to have access to. When we do that, it give, takes us straight to the section on the web page. And then there's a link to the data.gov flood monitoring ID stations. And this will take you into this website here. And that's got the station IDs, so basically the API access is done through this complete string here. Um, and everything that's defined as part of what we've already done in the data sources in ICM will take us to this point, and now we just need to identify the right ID for the particular station of interest. Um, at the top, as default, it's got a limit of 50 entries that it's showing. So if I increase that, the website will reload, and once it's reloaded, the, all the entries will be available from the environment agency. And that means I can now search for Benson, and I've got Benson lock referenced here, and this is the string that we'll want. Um, I can see from this that the ID for that site is 2001TH. So if I now go back into InfoWorks, and then here I say this is Benson 
upstream, uh, the unit type is height above datum. And the external data source, which we reference, is environment agency, as we did on the data sources there. Then external units, meters above datum. In here, the table will reference the particular station ID. So if I type in there 2001TH, click off the row, and then look at the data column. So now I can reference that particular level stage, and you'll see here that you also got the down stage. So one is the upstream and one is the downstream. And if I now right-click and update data, what you'll see is a task that appears along the bottom here. That takes the upstream values from Menson, populates those into the time series database. If I now look at that time series data, I can see the latest value in GMT there of 0 0.152 on the upstream side, and that should match what's on the website as well. And I can graph that and see the latest trends from that particular site. So, I mean, I just wanted to show that quickly because it's, it doesn't take very long. It helps you set up direct references that can be updated um, from that environment agency API, and you can do equivalent things from um, some of the standard database types that I, I showed earlier in the dropdown. I guess the, the next thing I wanted to show was around actually applying that data then to a model network. So we can populate the spatial TSDBs and the scalar TSDBs from external data sources. Once we've done that, we still need to assign those to particular objects in our hydraulic model. So under the polygons grid, you have um, something called the TVD connector tab. And that TVD connector tab basically has a unique ID for each stream that you're using then specifies what units type you're using, whether it's flow, depth, velocity, um, and then also has an input that can be brought in from external sources. So there'll be a, a flow, uh, depth, a velocity data stream in the TSDB that I'm referencing, and also a Benson lock depth stream in that same time series database. And then all you do is map that against a particular object type. So for flows, depths, velocities, for those of you familiar with ICM, you'll use that to map against um, conduits then reference the particular object ID, and then whether it's an input or a comparison. So comparison can be thought of as a model versus observed uh, report, whereas the input is more like a, a boundary condition that's being applied, perhaps equivalent to a level file at an outfall, for example. Once that's then all specified, you can carry out uh, a simulation. And in the run schedule of a simulation, I'll show that in a second as well, in the run schedule of a simulation, you would switch out the rainfall references that are normally there with a use TSDB tick box, where you can say, use the spatial TSDB, which has this blue icon for the rainfall, and use a scalar TSDB for the comparison results of point objects. Once that's done, those can then be compared, overlaid. So I can graph this link here, for example, which is the one that was referenced in that TVD connector and look at the depths. And rather than getting just uh, the downstream and upstream trace, I'm also getting an additional trace here for the comparison result. It's named depth, and then it puts downstream depth on because that's the result type it's looking at. And here it looks like a really good match. I mean, it, it is a good match, but um, it looks slightly better than it is because the scale of the graph. So if I change this to be a 0 0.15, for example, get more of an appreciation that perhaps there's a slight offset there. I mean, these are not particularly significant rainfall events, which is why the peaks match quite well. But basically, the capability is there to then use this as an, in an observed versus modeled um, kind of sense. And it's also possible to see that at the outfall point here, there is now a level applied, which comes from that same TSDB source. Okay, So this is like applying an, a level file, except that these can be continually updated and give you a, a longer term representation of what's happening. Finally, if I um, zoom out, you might have noticed that there's this grid that's been applied across the network. That's the radar rainfall grid. So if I play through the simulation, what you'll start to see in a minute is uh, some of the rainfall that's passing across. And there are the multiple events. Um, passing from you know the southwest to the northeast in this case. And what you'll see is there are three that pass across, which trigger those three different peaks that we see uh, in the observations. 
So I appreciate there's a, there's probably a lot more to this that, that I could talk about and would want to talk about, um, but we've only got an hour, of which there are only 15 minutes left, so I can't really delve into too much more detail there. Just one more thing I wanted to show was related to the time series databases and some of the new functionality. So what I have here is a, a blank time series database. It's got nothing in it at this stage. Um, what's coming with version 10.0 of the software is the ability to import in bulk some of the streams that are coming into time series databases. So you saw I defined that, sorry, that um, EA stream earlier, and that was done manually, and you do that row by row for each stream that you want to use. Um, we now have capability to do this in bulk, so I could import from CSV file, um, and then I've got a, a previously exported time series database here. And when I double click that, the CSV file is interrogated, and this is very similar to the open data import center functionality that you might be familiar with. It's referencing all of the different headers that you have in the CSV files and giving you the ability to map those to the internal fields on this observed tab of the time series database. Meaning that if I now do a test import and see what it tells me, it's going to process five lines from the external file, create five streams as a result of that, and the only things that are missing are the data sources because I haven't defined those in this um, example blank TSTB yet. If I OK that and then OK the import, we're now automatically populating from the external file, which is a lot easier to, to manipulate than um, doing these things manually row by row in the TSTB, automatically able to populate those five streams in one go, which I think is really good. Um, the other thing that we are introducing is related to the ability to scroll through so if I look at um, data that I have for a particular TSTB, if you've got years and years worth of data, you'd have to scroll through all those years to get to the particular points of interest. We've now introduced this go to date where you can populate a value and then press the go to date and it will take you straight to that date in the time series database rather than having to scroll continually to get to that point. So those are two new functionalities that should help with some of the data aspects and using data in ICM. Now, the last um, component that I wanted to talk about, so we've talked a bit about the asset information, asset repositories, using those alongside models, talked a bit about getting external data um, for use in models. We also had uh, reference to operational analytics, so the capability to look at things without necessarily having a hydraulic model available. And this is what I've got on the screen here. So um, SCADAWatch is accessed through an online portal. Um, you log in, and once you log in, you get access to a map view, you get access to data sources, dashlets, all kinds of different things to um, basically uh, cut your data and make it display in whatever way you like. Um, what we're looking at here is a CSO or five CSOs for a particular network in the US, which is why all the units are uh, in US units um, and from this we can already see that some of the sites triggered earlier than others perhaps that this fourth one is a, a pump discharge because of the flow rate going flat at the top uh, and we can also get a view on some of the volumes that we have from each of the discharge points through this little dashlet here that shows us the, uh, the pie chart with the different volume contributions and we've also got on this particular interface uh, a view of what volume passed through which CSO during which month of the year. And an insight that you might gain just from looking at this graph um, would be that this, uh, this brown one that's referenced here spills um, not just the most but potentially also spills earliest because you know it's the only one that had a discharge during the month of March. So there are immediately, for those of you um, familiar with this kind of thing, immediately insights that can be gained just by the visualization of that data in these different ways. That was just a, a quick example of CSO performance. Um, I've also got one here for modeled versus observed traces. And this is loading just now. This might be familiar to those of you working with hydraulic models on a regular basis. And um, we've got the rainfall across the top on this top trace. And then we've got the flow rates uh, in this middle, rate, uh, middle graph, and then the depth in the bottom graph. The smoother profile of the two is the model's profile, and the one that's slightly more, more jagged is the uh, observed data trace profile. 
And I guess one thing that I would pick out here is perhaps that the second event at this location um, is not represented as well in the model in terms of the peaks that are reached. Uh, and that might be due to the proximity to that first major event um, that happened just beforehand. So that kind of information, uh, again, might be uh, an insight that you can get from looking at this. Um, it's slightly different in terms of what you can garner uh, compared to what's in the hydraulic models per se, because this can be built up over time. Okay, um, When you do, let's say, live simulations, you could build up this picture, this understanding across uh, seasons, many years, rather than having to do a single hydraulic run that stretches that whole time to get that equivalent comparison. Um, some of the other things that you can see here, um, here we've got the rainfall again with accumulation for each of the events down the bottom. So the total depth of rainfall during an event and you can set the parameters for splitting events. Um, and then here along the bottom we've got the dry weather flow profile as this kind of green background area with the observed traces as the orange line. And then the, um, the remaining difference between those two would be the wet weather response. So this blue line here is giving us an indication of the wet weather response. It goes negative at some points to, to a small degree, um, but largely is aligned with the peak rainfall intensities that we see. So we see this spike here in terms of response and a spike here in terms of response with slightly more volume because that's a more prolonged event, has a, long, has a, a larger depth overall. And then we can also use this, uh, this tool to generate dry weather flow profiles that could then be exported or made available through scaling factors, for example, to the hydraulic model. So that's a bit of a link between modeled and observed traces. Um, the next one that I've got on screen here is more around pump stations and their operation. And what we have here is a, a, a level in, for, for a tank, for the wet well. Sorry, um, we've got a threshold at which the third pump in a station switches on. Um, so we've got three pumps in this pump station. First one is a dry weather flow pump. The second one is a wet weather flow pump. And the third one discharges via uh, a CSO. So it's a pump CSO. Um, and what we have here is the flows along the bottom um, for the dry weather flow pump in that orange color. Then we've got the wet weather flow pump, the first one in the blue color. And then crucially, the one that would cause a spill, um, the red line here. So this is really just to see whether the, that last pump is switching on, whether the other ones are already operating at that time, and trying to gain some of the insight as to whether these spills would have been genuine through to the levels that were reached or not. And then I guess you could compare that to modeled responses, for example, to tell you whether you should have reached that level in the wet well or whether you would have expected to reach that level in the wet well in the first place. And then just a rainfall comparison graph along the bottom. Pump run times on the right here, so the dry weather flow pump in blue, the orange segment representing the first wet weather flow pump and then the CSO one represented by this 22.3 hours mark there. And then a little, a little dashboard just showing you what the current wet well level would be in the, uh, in the location that's being referenced here. So that was the pumping station example. And I'll just go through this last one for the last couple of minutes before we finish off. Um, so here we've got nine rain gauges that are situated throughout the network. And those nine rain gauges um, here have an accumulation of depth that they've picked up during a particular period. That sum is also expressed on the right-hand side here. And we can see they're all fairly closely aligned and there's not too much deviation between them, maybe indicating that there weren't any particularly localized events at this time. Um, we also have the intensity graph along the bottom here to help uh, indicate where the maximum intensities might have been recorded, along with a bar chart. So maybe some slight difference here in terms of maybe 25 to 30 percent uh, change between this rain gauge 3 and rain gauge 4. So maybe some of those events were localized and had slightly higher intensities. Um, but those are all the kind of... Um, conclusions you can draw from looking at this information in isolation from perhaps models or anything else or just live data and depending on how that's visualized and how that's represented it can drive some insights. Here we've got a again that typical uh, rainfall intensity across the top, the accumulation during an event along the bottom, the split, splitting of events due to certain criteria um, and then that accumulation building up for the second event here as well. And then this one I found quite interesting um, when it was set up initially um, 
don't worry about the event durations, right? Uh, these are slightly unrealistic. You wouldn't expect to get an event that lasts 160 hours, I think. But um, it's just the fact that we can see, depending on the criteria for splitting the events, that the largest cluster are at the bottom here, where you might not expect to get any CSO spills or count them as significant events. But if you overlay all of these for different, maybe different catchments, different regions, or different rain gauges in different regions, they can help you understand perhaps whether certain parts of the area of responsibility that you work with have been subjected to far more significant rainfall or significant events than, um, than other parts perhaps. And that might help explain distribution of CSO discharges or, or equivalent information when trying to, to analyze that. Now that takes me to 1255. I think uh, we just want to go back to the slides for a second talk about some of the summary um, and, and then the next steps. So hopefully that's been useful so far, but um, there are one of the summaries, I guess, or one of the points I wanted to raise here is that there are uncountable different data sets that are available within water as a whole uh, and also within wastewater. I mean, once the title was set for this webinar, I started thinking about it and uh, just realized that the scale uh, and that I could have basically only touched the surface of that, the, ver the very bare surface. Um, Several of the data sets are complementary, but the connectivity often lacks. So driving the insights that what you're seeing in your hydraulics might be coming from um, a blockage or a failure and that kind of information, which may already be held in an asset repository, um, all being linked together can really tell a very compelling story that might be more difficult to get at um, if looking at particular um, data sets in isolation. And that kind of aligns with the insights can lack visibility within an organization. I mean, that's just from my personal experience um, in terms of things that I've focused on in the past may have been um, done perhaps to a certain degree in isolation, looking at just the hydraulics and trying to understand um, all the additional factors that could have impacted on the results that I was seeing um, would have been slightly difficult because of the actual visibility of that additional data. It would have usually been through going to speak to someone that might have some knowledge of that particular area of a network or the history of that area of a network, rather than being able to look at a tool and overlay it um, directly onto what I'm looking at with the hydraulic results. Um, and, and that brings me on to the last point there, which is that there's real power in aligning the tools and data sources, I think, at least in my opinion, um, and hopefully there are one or two points um, during this hour that have been of, of use or that have shown that. Um, some of the next steps from an Innovice perspective, I mean, I, I work with ICM and ICM Live. Um, the first thing I want to make sure we keep doing is adding additional data types. Um, many of you are using data types that we've not worked with before here, um, so making sure we help support those in our solutions is crucial. Um, and also keep enhancing compatibility as providers update their offerings. Uh, the data types that we do already support don't necessarily stand still. The format might change slightly, might be improved and making sure that we are always aligned with that as much as possible and helping um, helping you to gain access to that data I think is key. Um, and then leveraging the cross product insights further um, as per some of the examples that I've talked about here uh, I think is high on the agenda and something that I want to I keep uh, promoting as we go forward. That takes us on to the last poll question then, question three. Um, which is all about whether there were data interactions of interest that were discussed or shown. If so, which ones in particular? And if I go through these, info asset reference from within Infoworks ICM was all about looking at some of the, the failures, the CCTV on the surveys, close to um, maybe the links that you're looking at from an ICM perspective. Uh, Infoworks ICM output reference from within SCADA Watch was all about understanding um, what the model's telling you overlaid onto what observations are coming into telemetry systems uh, and trying to gain some insights from that. Operational data reference from within Infoworks ICM was all about the time series databases uh, and trying to get external data into your hydraulic models to try and improve their performance or use them in a near real-time sense. And InfoAsset Online view on asset data is one that I only talked about briefly. I didn't show because that would be a whole webinar in itself really, um, but that's just maybe an online portal onto asset data and how how useful that could be. And then other if there's anything else that was mentioned. Excellent, so operational data reference from within Infoworks ICM got the highest response there. Um, all about the time series databases. 
they're part of the um, ICM suite. So if you want to know more about that or what that's capable of doing, um, don't hesitate to get in touch. And also, obviously, some of the others that were a benefit. I mean, I'm really glad to see positive responses there. That's great. So thank you for watching.